Hi there. So this video is going to talk about how P53 can be regulated by post-translational modifications. So in a previous video, we spoke about P53 and its main function in the cell is as a transcription factor. It's able to go into the nucleus, find promoters, and turn many genes on. And we'll talk about those genes in a later video. This activity of P53 to go into the nucleus and bind promoters and turn genes on, uh, that is highly regulated by many different enzymes, which we're going to talk about a few in this video. So if you want to, if a cell wants to regulate P53 activity, if it wants to be able to have those genes be turned off or turned on, you can regulate the function, the location, the activity of P53. So in um, this video, we'll talk about that. Um, so here's an example of P53. In most cells, if there's no reason for P53 to be activated because there's no DNA damage, um, there aren't loss of nutrients or oxygen. In most cells, P53 is an un, in an unstable state. It is uh, ubiquitous and destroyed, um, or it is retained in the cytoplasm or somehow else kept inactive. So in most cells, P53 might be made but is inactive, destroyed, and so its target genes, uh, it is not turning on its target genes, which we will cover in later videos. Uh, when P53 becomes activated, well, what does that mean? Well, if the cell has sensed that something is wrong, so P53 becomes stabilized, so not ubiquitulated, is able to go into the nucleus, and is able to bind promoters properly and turn P53 target genes on. And those target genes will do things like arrest the cell cycle, um, allow DNA to become repaired, and uh, trigger apoptosis in the cell if the uh, damage is too great. So how does P53 become regulated? Well, it turns out that there are many post-translational modifications that occur on P53. So when we talk about this term post-translational modifications, we're usually referring to um, functional groups or other uh, molecules being covalently attached to P53 using enzymes. One of the most common ways P53 is regulated, and in fact most cells, uh, most proteins are uh, regulated, are by phosphorylation, a kinase binding to P53 and transferring a phosphate group to one of its uh, hydroxyls in uh, serine or threonines. And so P53 is highly regulated by phosphorylation. There are over 20 different serines and threonines in P53 that can accept phosphate groups from uh, various kinases. Now, are these phosphorylation events going to activate, stabilize P53, or will they make P53 unstable or destroyed? And the answer is it depends. It depends where that phosphate group is put on the P53 on, on which serine or which threonine. So phosphorylation can um, activate or inactivate a protein. It can make it more stable or less stable. It all depends on where that phosphate group is put on. Uh, ubiquitylation. We spoke in a previous video about the um, MDM2 ubiquitin ligase, which can bind to P53 and attach ubiquitin molecules to its lysines. And so P53 is regulated by ubiquitylation. It can be destroyed, sent to the proteasome, because uh, it has ubiquitins attached to it. There are more uh, uh, post-translational modifications that concur to P3, acetylation and methylation. So these are processes by which enzymes uh, transfer an acetyl group or a methyl group to uh, amine residues, amine functional groups, such as the ones that you find in lysines, on a protein. So P3, uh, there are many different residues in P3 can it, that, it, that can accept methyl groups or acetyl groups. And again, what are these groups going to do? Well, they might make P53 active or they might make it inactive. It all depends where these groups are added. And there are even more uh, sort of obscure post-translational modifications that can occur on P3, something called nedylation, something called sumolation, where you attach sumo or ned to P53. And these are a little more obscure post-translational modifications. But again, uh, the point of this slide is to talk about the idea that P53 can be acted upon by many different enzymes. You can attach many different uh, functional groups and proteins to P53 covalently, and this is going to have different effects depending on where these functional groups are.
are attached. So here they're going to make PC3 um, stable into the nucleus and be able to turn on genes, or they're going to make PC3 unstable, retained in the cytoplasm, and not able to turn on genes. So I want to give you one uh, example in this video on how P53 is regulated uh, by phosphorylation in the process of DNA damage. So we've got some DNA here on the left, and there's a P53 protein on the right. And in most cells, P53 uh, is made, but it's not needed because there's no stress in the cell. So under these conditions, uh, P53 interacts with its binding protein MDM2, which we covered in a previous video, which is an E3 ubiquitin ligase. And MDM2 will ubiquitinate P53, so that's covalently attaching ubiquitin proteins to um, lysine residues on P53. And P3 gets sent to the proteasome. It has a very short half-life. It's not turning on genes. It's not binding promoters. Now let's say DNA damage has occurred. Like we've got little spots there. Why did it occur? Well, could be uh, ionizing radiation, UV damage, carcinogens, mutagens, any number of reasons DNA damage uh, could occur. Now, we're not going to go into the detail on how damage activates uh, kinases, but there are proteins that scan the DNA, and when they um, physically uh, detect a change in the structure of DNA, these uh, enzymes called DNA damage kinases become activated. So there are kinases, and they have names such as ATM, ATR, CHECK1, and CHECK2. These are kinases which reside in the cell, and they become active upon DNA damage. So DNA damage has activated these kinases. We're not going to go into detail how they became active. We're just going to talk, just say they become active upon when cells detect DNA damage. So these are kinases. They're active now. What are they going to do? Well, these kinases either directly phosphorylate P53, or these kinases can phosphorylate each other, which can then go on in a kinase cascade to phosphorylate P53. Either way, the DNA damage kinases uh, phosphorylate P53, either directly or indirectly, on various residues, serines 6, 9, 15, and 20. We said there are a lot of residues that can be phosphorylated by P53. These are some of them. These DNA damage kinases will phosphorylate these serines. Now, I've redrawn P53 here, um, and it's phosphorylated on a bunch of serines, and now look at it, its interaction with MDM2. It no longer interacts with them, uh, with MDM2. And this is because those serines are located in the area of P53 that allow MDM2 to bind to it. And now that these residues have a phosphate group attached to them, that disrupts the binding interaction between P53 and MDM2. Those phosphate groups interfere with this protein-protein interaction. And so now these proteins do not interact. They have very low affinity for each other. So what's the result of that? Well, MDM2, when it binds P53, ubiquitinates it. Now, MDM2 is not binding P53. So what's going to happen? P53 will become stable. It will not be ubiquitinated and sent to the proteasome. It levels will be allowed to rise. It can then become active. It can go into the, promo into the nucleus, bind promoters, and turn genes on. And again, in the previous video, we talked about target genes uh, are genes that um, will do things like stop the cell cycle so that the damage doesn't become permanent, will repair the DNA, um, as well as trigger apoptosis if the damage is too great. So um, you can see here that phosphorylation regulated P53's stability. How? By regulating the protein-protein interaction between P53 and MDM2. This is further regulated by phosphorylation sites on MDM2. Right? MDM2 is a protein. It can be acted upon by kinases. And in fact, the ATM and ATR kinases can also phosphorylate MDM2. Right? Kinases can have many different substrates. And it turns out those uh, kinases, ATM and ATR, can phosphorylate MDM2, and that will also contribute to MDM2's inhibition. It will be unable to, to ubiquitinate P53 when it is phosphorylated on those serines, and I didn't write the numbers in, um, by those kinases, ATM and ATR. 
So under normal conditions at the top, you can see all those serines on PP3 and MDM2, they're not phosphorylated. And when DNA damage occurs, these serines are phosphorylated. Now again, there are other serines in P53 and MDM2 which would have the opposite effect. So it's the, these specific serines um, phosphorylated by these specific kinases that will uh, inhibit the interaction between these two proteins and allow P53 to become stable, active, and do its function in the nucleus. So that was just one example of how uh, phosphorylation can modify a P53's activity in the cell. Um, and in fact, like I said before, there are many different enzymes that can act on P53. Some, like the DNA damage kinases, allow it to become, P53 become stable and active. Other uh, phosphorylations will do the opposite. So it all depends on the kinase um, and where those phosphates uh, are added to the protein. So hopefully this is a good introduction for you to see how P53 can be regulated by one group of proteins um, and if you're reading up on other enzymes that act on P53, well, they're going to do either one of two things, make P53 stable, go into the nucleus and become active, or remain unstable, stay in the cytoplasm and become destroyed.